Imagine if someone asks you to count up to 50 in your head while several other people are counting at their own pace. You start to lose track of what number you were even on and have to start all over again. That's what it feels like playing this game. Yu-Gi-Oh! Capsule Monsters is a PS2 game that came out in late 2004 in America. I'm pretty sure you heard the lore before if you're a Yu-Gi-Oh! fan, but just in case I'll summarize it. Capsule Monsters was one of the games played in the manga before the conception of the TCG. Now in the manga, it was Mokuba who approached Yu-Gi to play this game. In fact, Mokuba was the champion of Capsule Monsters up until he fought Yu-Gi. Now, I'm not going to talk about the shenanigans around the situation on why this went down the way it did, but the game did appear again later in the manga, so it's safe to assume that Kazuki Takahashi had a soft spot for the game. It's a known fact that he's a big fan of tabletop gaming, so it's not a surprise that this concept of the game got a lot of love. Capsule Monsters not only appeared in the manga, but it also got two whole games in Japan before this one. One game for the Game Boy, and the other for the PS1. The subject matter for now is the PS2 game and not those. Regarding the extra love Capsule Monsters was getting though, it also got its own anime arc spinoff. Now, if the two games and the spinoff arc wasn't enough to show you that there's some kind of favoritism with Capsule Monsters, will another game convince you? Now, in this game's case, I have to see it with the lens of how good it is as a strategy game rather than a Yu-Gi-Oh game. If you watch my past videos, you might have an idea of what makes a good card battler, but what makes a good strategy game? I looked through the internet to see what people look for in good strategy games along with pondering on things that I like to see in them myself. Throughout the video, I'll mention certain qualities that the best strategy games have, and I'll be looking to see if Capsule Coliseum applies any of these qualities. It starts with this clean ass opening, and I gotta say, I was not expecting the shit at all. I'm one to think that Duelist of the Roses probably has the best opening among the Yu-Gi-Oh games, but this might be a close second. The opening kinda got me pumped, so we're already off to a good start. I boot up the campaign, and it starts to give me a summary. A tournament's gonna start soon, and it's up to Yu-Gi to just win it all. That's it, it's, it's just that simple. Now right here, I stopped and realized that this might be the first time I ever played as Yugi on this channel instead of a self-insert. In fact, of all the Yu-Gi-Oh games I ever played, I think I could only think of three games where you play as Yugi. I wish we had more Duel Monster era games made in the style of the 5D's World Championship games or Nightmare Trabador. Playing as Yugi in all the arcs of Yu-Gi-Oh would be crazy. After I set my name for the file, I'm thrown right to the menu. The game asked me if I wanted to pick a starter set or my own. I don't know what's in the sets, so I might as well make my own shit. When I chose to make my own, it just threw a bunch of crystals in my face and told me choose a symbol. Crystals are nice, and they're shiny. They're great in math. Now, symbol's color is corresponded to an element. The six types you all know and love are present in the game along with two more, wood and lightning. I picked wood because recently I've been getting into Magic the Gathering, and in Magic, the color I usually gravitate towards is green. After pimping out the symbol a bit, you then have to assign some points. But I have no idea what any of this means. I'm guessing MP is magic points, AP is attack points, uh, power points? And when I was done with that, That's my grandpa. What the hell? This is crazy. Full on voice acting? Is this the first Yu-Gi-Oh game with that? I'm surprised it's the four kids actors too. Usually games in this era cheap out and hire just random people to do the voice work. You're a real freak. Was there still a living Namekian? I'm pleasantly surprised by this. This is actually pretty cool. The voice work is rough at times, but damn does it hit the nostalgia. Grandpa starts to explain that there's a tournament coming up. He also starts to talk about the type advantages in the game. Now, most of these are easy to remember just through guesswork and game experience. Fire usually beats wood, water beats fire, etc. The only one that might take some getting used to is thunder beating light. He then starts to say that he has a few monsters for you but it's not for free. The next screen I'm taking to is the monster selection, and now I see what MP was. MP is monster points, the currency. I didn't invest anything into MP, so I can only make the bare minimum. Thankfully, I chose wood. The cheapest and weakest monsters here get a boost under my symbol. 
So even though I couldn't buy the best monsters like Feral Imp, the worms and the plants I got boosted and ended up being just as strong, if not almost. Apparently, water monsters also get a boost under me, which is perfect to counter fire monsters. Now, to elaborate on my choices a bit further, I had hopes that the worms would eventually evolve into something cool or get a neat ability. Usually, most games tend to reward people for picking the weakest units by giving them good abilities or cool evolutions. It's no guarantee, but it's a good guess. After choosing the monsters, you get a bit more flavor text and it's off to the first map. And on the first map, the opponent is Joey. He specializes in fire monsters, which could have been bad for me if not for using my brain to grab some water monsters when they gave me the option to. And as luck would have it, not only did I have the foresight to pick up some water types, but the map also leans heavily towards giving water monsters an advantage. Hold it! Wait a sec. There's a limit on which monsters you can use. Each stage has a set limit of monster points, and the total monster points of the monsters you use cannot exceed the limit. In order to move your pieces, you need AP. I see. Each piece has a set requirement of AP. And if I move it, then the AP on the screen decreases, correct? Yep. And if you don't have enough AP, then you can't move your pieces anymore. Damn, I really didn't have Dwayne's breath for that, huh? So with a system like this in place, that means you can't just throw in the best monsters every game and brute force your way to victory. You have to have a healthy balance of weak monsters to do some trip damage and a stronger monster to do the finishing blow. So I do my thing and I summon the monsters and the eggs. Now I start to move the pieces and I instantly realize that not all pieces move the same. I don't think we're alike at all. Let me explain most of the things about monsters that I learned from the first two maps. All monsters you own have their own level and experience points. A monster gains experience when it attacks, and it gains more experience if it destroys another monster. Each unit comes with a variety of stats with very little influence from the card counterparts that they have. Now, that might go without saying, but in this case where the game is so far removed from the source material, it's best to mention as many changes as I possibly can. Power points? This is just health. I have no idea why they didn't just use HP as an abbreviation. Attack and defense are self-explanatory, but there's a few background mechanics that affect these a lot. Certain panels on the map increase and decrease the stats of a unit depending on their type. An example of this would be the forest panels. These increase the power of wood units by a certain percentage. Sometimes it's 30%, sometimes it's 10 Maps also increase and decrease stats depending on the map's element. Now the last thing that affects your stats in this game is the symbol. All elemental symbols increase the various stats of two types. Since I have a wood symbol, my wood units get an attack and defense buff. My water units only get an attack buff, which is good enough for me. Other symbols increase different stats and abilities of units. Water, to my knowledge, increases the power and defense of water units, but the wood units only get an increase in defense, which is whack in my opinion. This is whack! I can't get jiggy with this shit! So, some symbols are clearly better than others. Thankfully, I chose a good one, because I can only imagine how my experience with this game would have been if I chose another symbol. I was told later on that I picked one of the better symbols in the game, which explains why I have very little trouble with the game. If the game had a bit more bite to it, I would have replayed the game using a different symbol. Moving on from the elements and stats, the next thing that makes the units different from one another is their movement and attack patterns. All units have different combinations of attack and movement patterns along with different ranges. There are only three patterns in the game that units can have the Rooks, the Bishops, and the Starburst-like patterns. Now amongst the patterns, the ones I find to be the most consistent are Rooks, mostly Rooks with an attack pattern of a Bishop or a Rook. These usually don't end up in compromising positions. If a unit is in a blind spot, you can simply just move it the direction you need to go into in order to hit it back. Rook units are usually a safe bet, but don't have a full team of Rooks. They have a lot of difficulty going across the map and they can't cut corners. Bishop patterns tend to be able to go across the map pretty fast and can cover a wide range of attack. Bishops that attack with a rook pattern are pretty good since they don't have positions that compromise them unless the range of the attack is short. Bishops that have a bishop attack pattern cover a lot of range on the map. In combination with rook patterns, it's a match made in heaven. I mention combination because you tend to end up pairing this with another unit on the board. That's not to say that you want units to not be covered by other units, but rooks have the capacity to handle themselves. Double bishops can't hit units right in front of them or three spaces away. If a unit stays in range chasing your bishop, 
you can't do much back. That's why I usually have a rook paired with them to cover them. Another drawback to the bishops is that they can't really move well in tight spaces. You'll find yourself awkwardly going one space left then one space right just to go forward. Now the last to cover and certainly the least of these patterns is the starburst. These to me end up being too situational a lot of the time. As an attack pattern it's not half bad. These kind of units have an easy time sniping other units and they also have an easier time getting around the board. However, they are much easier to hit in their blind spots. I usually bring only one of these along. Now units that move in a starter burst pattern are dog shit to me. They're usable and I'm sure some people think they're decent, but personally for me, they are not worth the trouble to use a lot of the time. There are a few more mechanics in the game, but I'll cover them when I get to them. While I was editing this video, I realized that in the script, I actually downplayed how bad Starburst movement actually is. This pattern is some doo-doo butter, dig on the ground dog shit. I didn't realize how bad this pattern was until I had to make the grid for it. What's even the point of putting a pattern like this in the game? What the fuck were they thinking? The first map in this game is against Joey, and they gave him fire monsters in a water-based map. I guess it's so the player can have an easier time beating him, it is kind of the tutorial stage. Now even though this is the tutorial battle, I kinda struggle with it. Not only because of the elemental advantage not being in my favor, but also I had no idea how the game flows yet. I didn't have that much of an idea of formations and strategy until the second area. Everything I told you before I didn't really figure out until I got further and further into the game. You can see that as I haphazardly move my unit to a vulnerable place. What the hell is this? Yeah, every unit in this game has an attack animation. Now some of them are cool, having dynamic camera angles and screen shaking to show the emphasis of the power of these attacks. But some of them are as interesting as dog water. It got some dog germs in it, so I guess it has a little bit of effort. Most of this is assets from Duelist of the Roses, which also has every monster in that game have an attack in a model, which is mighty impressive for its time. Making models and animations for such a huge pool of monsters is an insane amount of work, and I'm surprised they went through the trouble of doing this. Twice. Now having cool attack animations and strategy games is fine. They break the monotony of taking turns and attacking by adding a little flair to it. It's a video game after all. Even Pokemon would be a hard thing to sell if all the attack animations were non-existent. Now in those small moments of reprieve, you can also think about your next move while the attack is happening. However, you can't have the attack animations be too intrusive to the point that it ruins the game flow. I don't even think that this is something that only strategy games try to be careful with. Most genres usually have to struggle with this balance. For example, fighting game conversation often rotates to supers being too much of a spectacle and possibly slowing down the pace of a match. Whether you're on the side of having dynamic supers or not in fighting games, it's clear that these supers take a big chunk of time. One six a minute is kind of insane and they can't skip them. Now in strategy games, you usually can skip the animation, but as a designer, you don't want the animations you work so hard on to be skipped all the time. So the animators now have to create attack animations that are visually appealing that last for a short amount of time. That way they don't feel so intrusive to the player that they feel compelled to skip them for the rest of the playthrough. That's a challenging feat that I think most tactical games struggle with to this day. Off the top of my head, I think Fire Emblem is one of the series that does this balance well. Not only are the animations quick and flashy, but they also have you sit and watch these in case a critical happens or not during the combat. I think you have the option to turn these off in most games, but I see most people just leave them on because they don't really get in the way too much. Now, I have the animations off most of the time. Most of them are mid and the scenes take way too long to play out. The maps in this game tend to take me like 20 to 30 minutes already. I don't need to be here for 40 to an hour with these long ass animations. And just as an experiment, let's count to see how long it takes for one to play out. Twenty five seconds before I can interact with the game again. What the fuck? In this fight alone, a total of 15 battles happen. That's over six minutes of cutscenes playing for the map. If the total time of battle animations per map are as long as a Metal Gear cutscene, fucked up. Going back to the match with Joey, something happened after he shot me for my piss poor positioning. The water on the map started to rise, which means some of the panels now boost water units and weaken fire units. 
Not only does this weaken Joey further, making it very difficult to lose to him unless your positioning is as dog shit as mine, but it also shows the player very early on that the maps are subject to change mid-match. I don't know how fans of this genre of games feel about map gimmicks. I love it. Sometimes things in life don't go as planned, especially when forces of nature are in the equation. You have to be prepared for the unexpected. In this situation, I already made the good choice of taking some water units with me to fight off Joey's fire units and get a boost from the panels, but all of his monsters were on the land, so I thought that line of thinking was wasted, until the water level started to rise. Now fortunately, this map's mechanic helped me more than him, but the next time this happens, I might not be so fortunate. Now, at this point in the game, I didn't really understand movement and attack patterns yet, so a lot of my pieces were getting bodied, and I was just trading blows with Joey until I won instead of thinking things over more clearly. It's okay, because I was mostly trying to get in the groove of how things work and what I should look out for, but I was a bit worried about how death works in this game. Most games in this genre tend to have permadeath as a mechanic. Now, permadeath can make a player more cautious about their decisions, planning, and positioning. You can't just sick your strongest unit out on every map without repercussions. Who you think you is, Hector? Along with all of that comes the panic, the fear, and the heightened thought processing on preserving what you have when things go wrong. I love this feeling when it comes to permadeath in certain games. It's an emotional roller coaster that you don't really get in most things. It's not all good though. Personally, I think permadeath is at its strongest in games with faceless units. Permadeath in games with units that have a lot of character and or matter in the story doesn't hit the same way because it feels like you miss out on so much instead of just losing a resource. I don't mind cutting my losses if a unit died on a map that I really don't want to redo for difficulty or time reasons. In fact, I find myself doing that a lot when I was a kid with Final Fantasy Tactics. For the greater good, sacrifices must be made. I can always try to invest into another unit at the very least. It's kind of like spilling milk. It's no big deal because you still have some milk and you could just buy some more. That's 49 cent of spilt milk dripping all over my table. Somebody gonna drink this milk. It'll cost you, but that's how the game punishes you. The punishment is you spending more time and resource to get something back. Shit, sometimes you might not even want to spend the resource to get it back. But when the unit plays a role in the story or has an ability completely unique to them, it doesn't feel like I just spilled milk. It feels like I lost a herd of cows. If a faceless unit dies in a game, you still have the option to do and see all the content. If a face dies, guess you miss out on any of the side content that needs them alive and you miss out on the character dialogue. Now to be fair, you can always just reset to get the face back and you can argue that redoing the map and investing more time into the game is a good enough punishment. Because time is precious and you're not getting that shit back if you fuck up. With all that being said, how does this game handle the topic of losing units? When you lose a unit in this game, they stay in the pool, however, they are faded out. So you can't take them out to make more space for another unit. So are they just taking up space forever as a dead unit? Well, no. When a unit dies, it's benched for the whole next match. After the next match, you're allowed to use them again. Not only is the consequence that they miss out on the experience in that map, but they also miss out on the bonus experience in that map and the next. See, when you finish a map, your units and your symbol receives bonus experience points. This is added mostly for units that didn't get a chance to be active. A game like this needed something like this most likely because the movement of the units are so rigid and it's hard for them to get around to get the experience they need from beating units. So it seems like this game has a good handle on consequences, which is a quality you want to look out for in tactical games. If a tactical RPG is missing that quality, it probably misses the reason why you should play the game tactfully in the first place. Now, when you win a match in this game, you get to take two or more units from the enemy side that you destroyed on the map. I can't go into too much detail about it yet because I want to save the details on it when I talk about how this game handles another important aspect about tactical games. Choice. Ta-da! It's me! The man, the legend, Tristan Taylor. I really love the fact that this game is fully voice acted. Now Tristan's map introduces the concept of hazards on the map. On the left side is a tight hallway filled with poison. On the right side is a tight hallway filled with loose power line. If you look at the map beforehand, you can assert that the electrical monsters probably don't get damaged from the cables. I wasn't sure what resisted the gas on the other side though. My guess was either wood or dark. 
By looking at the other team though, I already have my answer. He has two wood units and two electric units. And with the way they're positioned, it's pretty obvious that he'll send the worms into the gas and the other two to the power lines. I chose a bunch of wood units and two fire units for the caterpillars. Problem is, they can't handle the gas. It's not a big deal. I could just have them wait around the area as the back line. While the turns passed with me trying to position my units well, this lizard got the jump on me. I wasn't checking the range it had between the turns. Something this game doesn't have that irritates the shit out of me is the fact that you can't preview a unit's trajectory. In most tactical games, if you hover over a unit, you can see the unit's potential movement, and sometimes even the attack range. It helps a lot to shorten the time of planning and accounting for all the obstacles in the way. This game does not have that, which is a big issue a lot of the time. Units don't move like units in most other tactical games. It's mad annoying to hover over the map and count spaces for every unit, especially the Starburst ones. They are the worst offenders of this. Maps in this game also have more stuff going on than most other games. Views are usually obstructed, and some of the obstacles are not really clear if you could attack past them or even move past them. I feel like I wasted so much time every match just checking every unit and counting every space over and over again. And I can't be perfect. A lot of the time, I miscalculate and it's mad frustrating. Imagine if someone asks you to count up to 50 in your head while several other people are counting at their own pace. You start to lose track of what number you were even on and have to start all over again. That's what it feels like every time I count spaces in this game. It's easy when it's just one unit, of course. But when there are several units within range, it starts getting really messy. The craziest thing is that none of this would be a problem if they just simply added a preview for the movement. Now this time he had to sacrifice a piece just to hit me. But a lot of other times, I usually get set back a turn just because of these kind of mistakes. Yugi, don't forget that I invented Dungeon Dice Monsters, so I'm a game expert myself. The first thing I notice immediately is that this map is small as fuck. Fights on this map are too tight. Now Duke has a legion of Karibos and Steel Scorpion. The Karibo moves like a bishop and it attacks like a rook, and the Scorpion does the exact opposite. They cover each other well enough for the most part, and in a map like this, they can possibly corner you? There were points where that instead of focusing on my units to corner, they try to corner my symbol instead. I almost forgot to mention that your symbol is like a king piece. You can move in any direction, but if taken out, you lose the game. That win condition can never really happen unless you play like absolute shit or your symbol has barely any health. Now, in the very beginning of the game, one of the things that you can invest in early on was the health of your symbol. Luckily, I decided to even out the points among the two stats and dump the leftovers in the last. I think in my whole playthrough, my symbol got hit maybe twice, and I usually had enough health to survive two or three more hits. With that kind of durability, it's possible to just put your king out there as bait just to make the CPU misplay like crazy. Because of Duke reaching so hard for my symbol, I was able to just pick off his units that he left in shitty positions. Yugi, here I come! Damn! At this point in the game, I was really feeling how the maps looked in the game so far. They can obstruct the view like crazy, but man do they look good doing it. I might sound like a broken record, but I wouldn't mind the difficulty in seeing things on the map if there was just a preview of movement for the units. Now, she has light and wood units with a water unit to cover the wood ones. This map also has a lot of obstacles in the way like the lamppost and the taxi. At this point, I wasn't sure if they could jump over the taxi or not. Well, they can't, and I'm pretty sure you can't attack past it either. It might as well just be a wall in my mind. Now I brought some thunder units into the fight to help beat out the light ones. The fairies she has have really good movement, and I felt like I'd be caught with my dick out if they move. Happy Lover has a movement of 4, and my movement usually averages around 2, so I can't really chase them down with that. I'd rather one-shot them than let them live and run away from me. I tried to bait out one of the fairies so I could one-shot it, but unfortunately, my scorpion is so ass without the symbol boost and I couldn't do the damage I needed. It's a good thing I planned for this kind of scenario because I had my worm right beside it just in case. I also got rid of another fairy that came forward too. I did a miscalculation and allowed myself to be hit by the stupid angel afterwards though.
When I first saw this cutscene, I thought there was more obstacles coming on the way. But instead, I think the power of dark units just went up because it's midnight. So if you brought out dark units for this map, you were rewarded for the boost to match her light monsters, I guess. Looking back at the footage now, I wish I came up on the sides rather than the middle. Even though I won, I would have had a much easier time if I'd just been more patient and just moved my units along the left and right sides accordingly. All of my thunder units could have been on the left side ready to strike the light units, and all of my wood units would have been on the right side cleaning up her wood ones. It's whatever though, cause the units that died were the ones that I didn't plan on using for the long haul anyways. I see you're dueling well, Yugi. The idea of this map is actually pretty cool. The panels have symbols and are divided between wood and fire panels. If you're on these panels, you either get a buff or debuff depending on the element. Simple enough. However, the caveat is that when you land on a panel, the surrounding panels change to the opposite element. So if I throw out my wood unit on the wood tile, it's possible that I make things difficult for the rest of my units. As much as I like the idea of this map, I have a few issues. The first issue I have is that the map is always just fire and wood tiles. It doesn't change depending on your symbol. So if you start with a symbol other than wood and fire, you wouldn't even care to notice this gimmick. The second thing is that Grandpa's units don't really take advantage of the mechanic in this map. He has petite moss for the wood tiles, but no fire units to take advantage of the fire tiles. How the fuck do you make such an elaborate map, but fuck up with the units? This game has this weird issue a lot of the time where the map is amazing, but they fall so short with the unit selection. It's like having a great beginning and middle of the show, but the ending is lackluster. Maybe if the game had a script where depending on what symbol the player had, Grandpa's map and units would change accordingly. They do this for another map in the game, so they have the ability to do it for multiple maps in this game, they just didn't do it for this one. After you beat Grandpa, Area 1 is cleared and closed off meaning you can't go back and redo the maps there. At least in the campaign. In free mode, you're allowed to do opponents and beat them as much as you like. However, you can't get experience from the fights or rewards doing that. Speaking of rewards, let me go over how you get more units in this game. When you beat a map, you get the option to take two or more units from the map. You can only take from a pool of units that you destroyed on the map though. You also receive money at the end of the matches that you can use to buy units from grandpa's shop. Every time you finish an area, the shop fills up with new units. The units that come in the shop are chosen at random and they stay in the shop until you buy them. Now remember, you can't go back to the maps you already beat, so the money is a finite resource for the most part. This should have put the player in a situation where they have to really consider which units they buy from the shop and pick from the duelist. However, this potential can never be realized. See, most of your unit stat gains come from the symbols level going up. Sure, they get a decent stat growth from leveling up, but it's nowhere near the huge boost they get from the symbol. This will put players in a situation where instead of choosing units to balance their roster out, you'll just gravitate more towards units that get a boost from your symbol. Units that don't get a boost from your symbol are laughably weak, with the exception of some chunks of fire units. I found wood and water units being double the strength plus at level 1 than most units with a different element that had a higher level. This also means that at a certain point in the game, you'll just end up using units that favor your symbol even in situations that you're supposed to be in a disadvantage in. There were maps with legions of fire units, and I did not give a shit because my wood units could take a hit most of the time. And since water units get a boost under my symbol, I had the option to piss out some water units on the map. Now if the game scaled the opponents properly, this would have been a smaller issue instead of being one of the bigger ones but the level scaling of the units is so dog shit. The level of the units all the way up to the end game will always be level 1, with a few exceptions here and there. This makes the game easy as fuck, especially if you're playing with the approach of throwing caution to the wind and just rushing down your units. You'll end up sacrificing a lot of units, but they come back off the bench anyways after one fight. Even if they didn't get experience, like I said before, the level up gains are nowhere near the boost they get from your symbol, and your symbol always gets experience. The boost from the symbol wrecks any design choice and decision in this game. No reason to pick units that don't favor my symbol. My choice of which units to take into the fight is limited to two elements. No real reason to buy units that are not wood or water. And the units that you'll pick off the enemy units will be units that get a boost from your symbol or just rare and cool units. 
which you can't even use properly since they don't even have the symbol boost. I don't care about my units not getting experience, so any choice of picking and choosing who gets the experience doesn't matter anymore. Well, except for a few exceptions, but I'll get to them soon. The symbol literally makes and breaks the game. You can't even change your symbol at any point in the game to entertain using other units you bought or won. Now, if they had just scaled the enemy units better, this wouldn't be that big of an issue. It'll still be an issue when it comes to the game design and how you make choices outside of battle, but not to the balance of the combat. This doesn't mean that the game is null and void of choice, because whereas we can choice outside of combat, in combat it's filled with choices. Now, if you're playing the game without a care in the world, you'll probably fly through this. However, if you're trying to beat these maps without losing a unit fire emblem style, it's actually quite the challenge. Because of the rigid movement most units have in this game, no unit can really solo a map like Hector or Petra. Because most pieces have a blind spot or they can't itch certain spots fast enough, you'll usually have to have different groups of pieces together to cover each other. And the computer in the mid and late game is no slouch. The AI takes into account all the best moves it could do like a chess AI in a sense and move accordingly a lot of the time. However, the AI cannot take into account your special abilities. It also throws logic out the window if it starts to see your symbol as bait. It's kind of like a CPU in a fighting game. It reads the fuck out of your inputs, but once you find some cheese, you're gonna shit all over it. Now back to the game, one of the new units I went to buy was the Great White. Come on down and chump some of this shit. The shark moves like a rook and it attacks with a starburst pattern. I personally like this piece even though it's situational. Mostly because it can snipe units with ease and it can also move around the, the map a bit easier than most other units can that usually have a starburst pattern going on. You fight Weevil in a forest next to a lake, and they put Weevil right in the middle of the lake too. Oh, you motherfuckers. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's set up this way to weaken any fire units coming his way. Something to note from this point on is that some opponents will have signature monsters. In Weevil's case, it's this worm. Weevil up at night playing with his worm. It should have just been Great Moth. Great Moth would have been perfect as a boss unit, but instead it's a pitiful ass worm. The movement and attack range on this unit is terrible, and the rest of his units are not that much better. In fact, his best unit is not even a wood unit, it's the water one. What kind of shit is that? Halfway into the match, the map will start to brighten up and give a boost to light units. I just wish they put the map to good use by having better team compositions for the enemy units. After I step on him, I decide to take the worm as a reward. My logic at the time was that there was probably a chance for it to evolve at some point. The game advertises the fact that you can fuse and evolve units in this game. Not too much of a stretch to think that Larva Moth can evolve into Great Moth. That makes sense to me. There's nothing more breathtaking than the majestic vastness of the ocean. This map is pretty simple and it seems like they put a bit more thought into the units. He has an earth unit on the side with the land to flank while having the water units attack head on. As time passes throughout the match, the map starts to change form. Landmass and Shipwreck rises from the ocean to give more advantage to the earth units? This change helps me more than him. Half the water tiles on the map are gone and now Mako's units end up being weaker. I have no idea what the thought process of behind this decision, but it's definitely dumb. What an imbecile. They did one smart thing just to muck it all up. The idea was good, but because of the poor battle planning, it ends up hurting the game in a way. At least Mako has an ace monster. This game doesn't have the legendary fisherman. I'm assuming a lot of the Battle City monsters are missing due to this game simply using assets made from Duelists of the Roses. It's clear that they didn't want to make anything new and just wanted to reuse assets, and I don't think it's out of laziness, I think it's more so to the fact that they had to rush this game out pretty fast. There's a lot of monsters that were cut out of the game with their data still being in it, so it's easy to assume that they ran out of time making this game. It's clear there was a vision for this game, but it's just unfortunate that they didn't have enough time to flesh out the game some more. We interrupt this program to bring you a special bulletin. Thank you so much for watching this video and it means a lot to me that you're still watching it now. There's a few people I want to shout out in this segment and there's also a few things I want to make people aware of in this segment as well. 
First off, shout out to Jason Graves. This is a person that reviews Super Nintendo RPGs on their channel. And recently I received a shout out from them, which is very heartfelt because I've been watching this person for a very long time. This was one of the people that I will watch while editing my Reshuffle Destruction video. I've watched all his videos. If you're into Super Nintendo or RPGs in general, I highly recommend watching his stuff. It's pretty good. I also want to say that he used me as a reference for his own video. And I got to say that like, it's kind of crazy to get to a point where that people use my video as a reference for talking about a game. That's crazy. Uh, the second shout out goes to Scrubber Buster. He also shouted me out in a video. If you're into GBA Yu-Gi-Oh games and tips and tricks about them, definitely watch his stuff. It's pretty interesting, good stuff. Uh, I like to talk about some of my personal channels. For one, my Twitch channel. I try to stream as often as I can. I do have a schedule there. However, I have not been able to follow it as of recent because of a lot of things getting in the way, but things should be back to schedule as soon as this video is released. Follow me on my Twitter. I tend to shit post and talk about video games and card games there pretty often. The other thing I want to talk about is the Patreon and the newly launched membership program on YouTube. For anyone that's been supporting through Patreon, thank you so much. It means a lot to me and I will do my best to keep up with the benefits, especially the challenge benefit. I will personally DM people in this tier about what the challenge would be. There will be more details about how all the rules and stipulations work with this in a community post on Patreon and the YouTube channel pretty soon. The same benefits in different tiers of Patreon also apply to the different tiers on the YouTube memberships. The only difference being the price the YouTube membership will cost just a little bit more for one, because some of the options on the YouTube membership prices wise is unavailable. And two, to push more people towards Patreon, because with Patreon, I could personally DM you. It's easier to keep in contact with my supporters. Whereas with YouTube, I'm not sure if there's a way to like contact supporters besides like the community posts. The best way after that would probably be Discord for the most part. So if you do enter a higher tier on the YouTube membership, please join the Discord server. More details on how some of these benefits work will be explained in a future community post on YouTube and a future post on Patreon as well. Been waiting for you, Yugi. Raptor has a map that has poisonous panels in the north and east of the map. The only monster type that can survive it are earth units in this map. His units are mostly earth with a bit of dark and lightning mixed in. It would have made more sense if the mixed units were light to cover the earth units from their weakness, which is dark. I don't know why earth is weak to dark. It's the most difficult thing for me to remember in this game when it comes to type advantages most of the time. Usually wind beats earth, but okay. Sure, Jan. There's a point in this map that the game starts to be really dramatic as he summons two-headed King Rex. And admittedly, it kind of lives up to the hype. Earth units tend to have insane amounts of HP and goddamn does it show on him. The map, the symbol, and the terrain boost on it makes it scary to take on with one unit. Not to mention that it got some good movement too. But who's to say that you gotta shoot him the fair one when you could just jump the shit out of him? During my fight with Rex, I noticed that one of my units had a special ability now. I see that my guess was correct in thinking that the weaker units probably get special abilities if you invest into them. My Lava Moth and Petite Moths both got healing abilities. The Needle Worm had an ability that I didn't really take advantage of until late game, and it's absolutely insane. It could give itself a barrier that can block one incoming attack. With this ability, you can bait the fuck out of the computer since they don't take specials into account. Since I'm talking about special abilities, let me segue into a box that most tactical games have to check. So if you don't got no sauce, then you're lost. Mm -hmm. These games usually have a wide variety of jobs and classes. Black mages, red mages, blue mages, archers, gunners, samurai, ninjas, all of them have unique traits and abilities from one another. This can keep the game from feeling bland and gives more variety and depth to the scenarios that they make for the game. With this kind of variety, a majority of playthroughs will be vastly different from one another, keeping the replay value and the experimentation in the game high. If a tactical game checks that mark, most people will come back to the game wanting to try new abilities at team comps. This game is so close to being there for me, but it fucks it up in the strangest ways possible. Bitch, that's a mistake. First off, not being able to change your symbol kills the potential of experimenting with different units. 
Four elements out of six will be vastly inferior no matter which symbol you choose. All the pieces have different patterns of attack and movement which helps with the variety a bit, but aside from that there's not much difference between a lot of units. The fix to this would be the special ability some units get to separate themselves from the rest. However, the way abilities work in this game is the worst I've ever seen in a video game. So first off, you don't really know which units gets abilities in the first place. Oh, That's not too bad, especially if you know Yu-Gi-Oh and video game logic. Abilities tend to go more towards the well-known monsters and the uber weak monsters. But a lot of units in the middle is hard to tell if they even get anything at all. And when they do, oh, oh. it's something that's just completely ass. One of my units got the ability where they decrease the power of wind elements on the map. Which sounds good at first, until it says that it's for one turn. Oh no I can't. If you could use it every turn it wouldn't be too bad. But they have two restrictions. The first is that each ability has a limited amount of uses. Most usually have between one to three uses. I understand why this is a thing because magic power isn't a thing in this game like most other RPGs. I'm not gonna be here. <laughs> However, this restriction with the next one makes this so much worse for no reason. The only time a unit can use an ability during a turn is before the unit's movement. Step back and sing it for a vomit! <laughs> so let's say you have a unit that heals other units. You can't move that unit towards the damaged unit to heal it. If you move it, you're locked out of using the ability for the turn. The damaged unit has to go towards the healer in one of the spots that the ability takes place in, then use the ability. Ha! The unit that used the ability also can't move that turn. This shit is so cumbersome and so stupid that you won't even bother using abilities a majority of the time. So not only are the number of uses restrictive, but your movement is also restricted as well. Why even have that restriction along with the first one? It, 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 it. Don't make no more fucking sense. If it was just a limited amount of uses, that would be fine. The player will have to think about the right time to use them. But to restrict your movement as well makes the choice to use it non-existent. With support abilities like healing, two units will have to commit to actions that leave you open. With ability that nerfs units, it's never really worth losing ground in an area just for a single turn nerf. The only abilities that may be worth using are the ones that attack or put a barrier up on a unit. Abilities that put a barrier on a unit or themselves are definitely worth it, especially at the start of the match. The barrier lasts until it gets hit, so the return on investment is humongous. Attack abilities are only worth it if the range is ridiculous. Great Maw, for example, has a special ability where I get hit multiple units in its range. Thing is, I think it can inflict friendly fire. I don't know, I never used it and tested it, so who knows. Most times it's just better to travel and hit the unit directly anyways. Usually the units with great attack abilities already have some of the best attack range and movement in the game. If this was fleshed out and thought about a bit more, this could have given the game the sauce it needs to stay interesting and replayable. But as it is now, it's hard for me to justify coming back to this game. Boring. Yawning. Hmm. So you finally came, Yugi. Mai is easily one of the best opponents to fight so far, and it shows just how much more the game could have shined if they actually put more thought into the team compositions. She has 7 units divided almost half and half of fire and wind, with the units having good attack range and power under her symbol. The map is this stretch of planes with an open gate in the middle acting as a choke point. Panels give earth units a boost in the map, however the power of water units are decreased. This makes it a bit more difficult to counter her fire units with water. When I fought her, I mostly took wood units along with two water units. I thought that maybe this would be good enough, but I started to get my buns clapped real soon. My movement and planning around a choke point was absolutely garbage and I got caught in an awkward situation real fast. It doesn't help the fact that I brought along Larva Moth hoping it gives me a good return on investment if I get it some good EXP. See, the other worms were useful because they had decent movement and at least they could attack straight ahead. Larva Moth has shit movement and it attacked corners only with range of 1. Trying to set up kills for this thing was incredibly annoying, but if there was any map where it could get experience off kills, this would be the best one. 
because wind monsters are weak to forest monsters, so it can one-shot wind monsters she has. What makes things worse is the map's gimmick. Every few turns, the wind blows harder and harder. Hey yo! With this comes a huge power boost to wind units on the map. This means that the longer the match goes on, the stronger they get. Let too much time pass and the game becomes such an uphill battle, literally. Especially when you consider that the movement for the Harpies is absolutely insane at this point in the game and eclipses the movement of all your units you'll have at this point. I had to give up the first time because it was too much of a struggle to continue it. Even though I wasn't losing, it was taking way too much effort just to come back from the positional mistakes I made early in the game. In the second match, I was much more prepared and positioned my units to be close together at the choke point instead of separately dripping past the gate. I had less trouble this time and I managed to get some kills with the moth too. A map like this shows the beauty and potential that this game could have had if it just had more time to cook. Up until this point, my feelings on the game ranged between shit and mid. But after this map, I saw the vision and I believe what it could have been. Welcome to my stage, Yugi. I find it really charming that they referenced the fact that he was the champion of capsule monsters up until Yugi came along. And the fact that these interactions are voice acted is perfection. This map is similar to Mize in that there's a choke point in the middle, except this time instead of one huge choke point, it's two thinner ones. There's also this added pressure of moving your units up to the choke point as the turns go by because of the map's gimmick. More and more of the map becomes exposed to electricity. Lollygag and wait too much and you'll end up in awkward spots with hazards all around. Mokuba's units also have attack patterns that try to be in range to snipe you off without being present at the choke point. From a battle planning perspective, this isn't half bad. But the units Mokuba have don't do enough damage to make this scenario too scary. The area is cleared now and it's time to move on. Will the rest of the game be constructed in the same way similar to Mai? Or is it more curb stomps with minimal effort? The shop has a new supply of monsters now and I'm not gonna lie, my element aesthetically is just so fucking ass. It's just a bunch of bugs in the shop. Go keyboard? The fuck is that? Who wants to use a fucking bed bug? Oh, Yugi boy, you're my next opponent. Hearing Pegasus again is music to my ears. Whatever you say, Yugi boy. I miss you. Pegasus has a bunch of units that all get a boost from the map in some shape or form. Some by panels, other by the map bonus. Not a single tomb monster in sight though, which is incredibly strange and lazy. Duelist of the Roses definitely had two monsters in that game. They could have easily reused the assets of the two monsters from that game and put them in this game. Shit, at least give him some skull of red archery, girl. Now it's in this map that I stumble upon a discovery. When I move my larva, I noticed on the next turn that I had the option to evolve. However, I didn't have this option before I moved. I started to have a guess in my head on why it was after and not before, and my guess was in the ballpark. Some units that evolve have other requirements besides being of level. In Larva Moth's case, it has to be on a tile with a forest boost of a high amount. Not every map has forest tiles, and in fact, out of the remaining maps, I think only two more have forest tiles high enough to evolve my Great Moth to Ultimate Great Moth. This means that evolutions can be completely missable in a playthrough. I get that you kinda wanna hide some of the good evolutions, but I think locking them behind level requirements is already good enough. I already don't know which units actually evolve, and now you want me to also guess if they need to be on a certain panel with a specific boost? Fuck wrong with it! Imagine something this stupid being in Fire Emblem, like I can only become a lord if he's level 10 and also in the middle of a fucking mountain. What? <laughs> level 10 was already difficult as is, and you want me to do this as well? How would I even know that? I begin to beat the absolute dog shit out of Pegasus. Great Moth has good stats, movement, and attack range. The issue now though is that Great Moth is expensive as fuck to take into fights, but it's worth the cost. You turn into the man I thought you would be. This bug is almost a one man army, easy to move in and out of attack range while also being able to take a hit with ease. If the enemy units were higher level, it probably wouldn't be getting away with so much murder. But this is the mid game and the enemy still has level 1 units. You 
Yugi, I'm still learning this game, so please take it easy on me. Bakura's map looks so gorgeous. It's kind of random that his map is just some place at night in Japan. Everyone else, with a few exceptions, has some kind of theme that reflects them as a character. I guess if you reach a bit, the scenery is pleasant and polite looking in a way. I know that in the Japanese dub, he speaks with a polite pattern of speech, so maybe it reflects that. <laughs> the map mostly powers up dark and earth units, with a small boost to light and wind units on certain panels here and there. If you go first, you get to see immediately that you're getting flanked by sniper units. Autumn Leaves moves like a bishop and attacks with a starburst pattern, and you don't have much room when trying to deal with the flank. It's this ultra thin corner that takes a unit 2-3 to three turns to fully get out and strike back. Meanwhile, he has units attacking from the front with good attack range. Fortunately, Great Moth was one of the best units to use against the flank. It had good enough movement to get through the choke really quick while also having the attack range to fight off the flankers and the front line. This is also one of the few maps where a unit that has a starburst movement can shine. They have a much easier time cutting through the choke point over the rooks and bishops. The map wasn't much trouble, but I like the fact that the scenario was constructed better than most of the others so far and required a bit more planning and precision than usual. Bandit Keith is in the Pharaoh's tomb surrounded by gold. I feel like it would have driven the theme home if it was a casino surrounded by chips and slots, but at least there's a lot of money lying around, so close enough? With the way the obstacles are set up, there are three paths to get to the other side with the only way of crossing to the neighbor sides being the intersection in the middle. Taking units that move like a bishop will hold you back so much since they can't maneuver well in any of the paths. However, anything with a bishop attack pattern can easily dominate the middle path. It was a no-brainer to send them off down the middle, but I struggle with movement on the right side of the map. Anything that attacks with a starburst or a bishop pattern will struggle in the hallways on your end. Meanwhile, for him, the way it's set up, his units will have a much easier time sitting somewhere and hitting incoming units. The right side was a lost cause and I mostly focused on the middle and the left. Keith's best unit is the Barrel Dragon, and man is this shit a problem. It has amazing attack range and good movement, and with the map and symbol boost, I can see it one-shotting most of my units except the Great Moth. If he had decided to summon this early in the match, he would have gave me a run for my money. Unfortunately, I think the AI won't summon the boss unit until a few turns pass. Also, because he's inclined to send Barrel Dragon down the middle, the AI is prone to just being baited out to attack the symbol rather than the units, making the dragon very easy to pick off with your other units. And Mans is out. What's up with that? The construction of the map really forces you to consider which units to bring into the fight that can fight comfortably in these type spaces. Scenarios like this show the potential in making the player think about the choices they make in and out of the battle, but the units in the scenario lack the bite needed to reach that point of being good. Impressive. Orion Scenario has a Fire Emblem vibe to it. I feel like I've seen this kind of structure in an underground map in one of them, but I wouldn't be able to put my finger on which mission exactly. You both start behind the wall of ruins that your units will have to go around in order to reach the enemy unit and symbols. His units have extremely weird attack ranges and it frustrated the fuck out of me to hover over one of them and count the range over and over again. The Easter Island heads being the worst offender of this. They move with a star pattern and they attack like a bishop. And with two of them on the board along with another unit with a star pattern, it was incredibly annoying. Not to mention the fact that I lost a unit due to a miscalculation and had to restart the whole match. It probably would have been a lot easier to just have my great moth on the front line, but I didn't want to get caught out in an awkward position since I'm behind a wall. Also, I wanted my other units to get some experience as well. Because she's a ball hog. You are Pharaoh. Are you ready to lose everything you hold dear? The last opponent of the area is Mary, and this map is not only crazy as fuck, but it also might be the best map to evolve your units at this point. 
there's these cubes on the map that you have to travel across with each one having a certain element. You can use these cubes to evolve the units that you have that need a certain boost to evolve. I use this map to evolve my petite moths into larva moths when I realized the deal with this map. They may merit a team of units to take advantage of all the open space in the map and the bonuses from the panels. His boss monster Zoa is pretty scary with the range and power it has. Unfortunately, at this point my units were starting to get really strong from the symbol boosts and the level ups, so the rest of his units could not keep up at all. Come on man! That's too easy! Now, the last two points I want to talk about when it comes to must-haves for tactical RPGs are a good story and map design. Let's be real, the average person can't even sit down for a game of chess. You think they want to play an anime version of it? But if the game had a good story to motivate the player to see more of it, even the genre's biggest haters might give a game or two a try. So let me not beat around the bush and straight up just tell you that the story in this game is non-existent. The dialogue being fully voiced is actually amazing, and the art renders for this game is some genuine good looking shit. These are some of the cleanest renders I have seen of Yu-Gi-Oh characters from a video game. However, that's not enough to keep the majority to keep on playing this game. The dialogue at best is a few nice callbacks to past events, but overall it's a lot of filler that can be charming at times. This game could have easily followed the events of Duelist Kingdom and Battle City, but instead it made its own lackluster tournament arc. Now that I got that out the way real fast, let's talk about the maps. It may be that I don't have much experience in tactical RPGs, so take this with a grain of salt. But I think this game has some of the best maps I have ever seen in the genre. All the maps I've spoken on so far is just the icing. The maps from this point on are some genuinely amazing stuff to me. Now, I'm only going to talk about the characters and their maps, and I'm not going to go into as much detail with how I fought them like in the past 30 minutes. This video is getting too long for the game that I thought was made. Now, some of the guys in Area 3 and 4 appear in Area 5 as well for a rematch, so I'll be talking about their maps back to back. I'm also going to cover the ones with the mechanic in their maps. Ishizu's scenario was fairly simple, so I won't speak on hers besides the fact that the rematch took me a while to pin her down. Bakura's is simple as well, although the map looks cool as fuck. We finally meet, Battle. Shoddy's maps are some of my personal favorites in the game. I don't know why they keep having this man duel in these games. His first map confused me for a bit. When you're starting out in a match, you choose where to put your symbol. In this map, you can't choose where you put it. It can only go in one of the two fixed spots. You and Shawty symbols are in a rat race to reach a safe spot while you both throw your units into the pit as fast as you can to destroy the enemy symbol. Now, if memory serves, I think the panels in this map don't give a boost, and I think the map boost is non-existent, so it's just straight hands. Issue is though, my symbol level and stats for my units were so high that the damage they did to my units was abysmal. Shoddy's second map is my favorite. Motherfucker looks so evil in this second render too. Man went through slouching to the gamer lane. The stage is gorgeous. Looks like something I've seen in a fighting game. Probably like Soul Calibur or some shit. You're at what seems like a palace with a flight of stairs in the middle. A dragon statue surrounded by crystal lies at the top of the stairs. The stage is pretty open with not too many obstacles in the way, so you'll find yourself slugging it out in the middle pretty fast. But as the turns go by, I start to get this feeling that the statue was more alive than stone. Then the dragon unleashed from the crystal prison and now is towering over the arena. At this point, I have no idea what the fuck will happen next. I can't just start playing passively. Gee, I sure hope this dragon doesn't try anything for- Oh no! Now, it's expected for the dragon to shoot flames down the middle of the map from now on. So I try to push the fight to the other side of the map. But for the dragon to turn its fucking head and blast me over there too, was not even a thought in my mind. Not to mention the fact that the element of the flames changed. This map is so fucking sick. <laughs> Greetings, Pharaoh. 
Merrick's map mimics the feeling of being in a shadow game. The first time you fight him is in a map filled with poison. See, when a unit lands on a tile, a tile on the opposite side of the map will sink into the poison. The tile stays in the poison with no way for it to come back up. So it becomes a race to either get to the middle of the map to handle business there, or dance on the tiles to sink the tiles on the other side and make the opponent have an area that's inhabitable. The second map seemed pretty normal at first. It's just a mountain with a lake. I was confused because a good chunk of the map had water and his units were fire monsters. Until several turns in when all my units were in the lake, which is the worst spot you could be in for this map. Because what I thought was a mountain wasn't a mountain at all. It was a fucking volcano and now the whole map is on fire. Get the fuck out of there! Anybody who was in the lake just now is sitting in the lava. The match turned into a scramble for me to get the fuck out of there. Side note, I find it funny that Merrick's ace unit is the Crimson Sunbird, which is the closest you could get as a parallel to the Winged Dragon of Raw. It's a duel against you! Last but not least to talk about is Kaiba. This map looks like the future in Dragon Ball after the androids wreck shop. The map is riddled with electrical hazards and debris that falls and changes the map's landscape. With a big ass hole in the middle, the only way to get to Kaiba is to go all the way around. On the way to him, you'll clash with his units at some tight choke points. The second time you fight him is on the grandest stage in the game. An airship soaring through the sky with multiple panels giving boost to a multitude of elements. His units also have insane range with the most notable ones being La Jin, Blue Eyes, and the Meteor Black Dragon. It's pretty awesome that his strongest unit is actually the Meteor Black Dragon rather than the Blue Eyes again like the first time. As the fight goes on, the clouds start to cover the area and block off the sunlight, taking away the map boost to light units like his Blue Eyes. Now I think this is something to give you an opening to fight his blue eyes, but unfortunately, the fight is already easy as is. I mentioned this before, but the level of their units do not go up at all throughout the campaign. Looking at his level 1 blue eyes have 140 attack is pathetic. You're a disgrace to the game! For a comparison, most of my unit's attack power was beyond 250. My Noodle Worm can technically one-shot his blue eyes. And this problem persists throughout the entire in-game. The maps are so amazing and would have added so much of a challenge if these fights actually scaled the units well. What a waste of potential. After beating Kai with the credits roll and you're back at the menu with the option to start the campaign all over again. You can continue with the save file you have but the game does not scale up with you. Everything is the same. It's a new game plus without the plus. The only reason to do this is to collect all the units. So the only way to get any merit of a challenge at this point is to play this with your friends via multiplayer. This game has a versus option and honestly, the battles in this game with friends probably sound sick as hell. The maps are so good in this game, I'm sure they make PvP battles explosive. But that's all there is to capsule monsters. Such a shame because I really like the idea and mechanics of the game, but the execution is lackluster. All it needs is one or two good changes to actually make a good game. Now fortunately, someone in the comments of my community post made it aware to me that there was a mod for this game that was out in the wild. The Yu-Gi-Oh! Capsule Coliseum Libra mod from a creator known as Professor Oak. Talk about a turncoat, Oak said fuck that Pokemon shit, see me in Capsule Monsters. This mod re-envisions the game by balancing certain units, adding abilities, scaling the difficulty properly, adding bonus content such as secret fights with a chance to get a rare unit, and it also adds units cut from the game, although they don't have 3D models, so you'll run into some jank if you try to battle with the animations on. If you're a tactical RPG fan with any interest in playing this game, I highly recommend playing this version of the game. It can't fix everything like how limited the game feels with options during a playthrough since you can't change your symbols mid-game. You still have to make a new file to experiment with other units. But the fights are a lot more engaging and the unit selection for the opponents is top notch. Now, I was recently told from a video of a bigger channel that linking patches and mods is not allowed on YouTube, so I can't leak the mod in the vid or comments. But 
I'm pretty sure you could find the Yu-Gi-Oh! Capsule Coliseum Libra mod with a famous search engine. I don't know if I'll have the time to do this, but I do have a slight interest in streaming this game and other Yu-Gi-Oh! games on the channel if people are up for it and support it. I think Capsule Monsters is a charming game and it's clear that there was some love put into it. I think most of the issues it has stems from it being rushed out into the public instead of cooking in the oven for a bit longer to be fleshed out better. This game at least was begging for a new game plus and it feels like they wanted to give the game exactly that but just ran out of time. It's a shame really because the amount of experimental Yu-Gi-Oh games after this game just dwindled. I think the only experimental game after this was... Oh, really Breakers? Oh, yeah, I don't think I'm gonna talk about that game unless I'm making a living off this. Quick shout out to some of my higher tier Patreons being Hind, A Lazy Dragon, and Lucidity Dark. And thank you so much to the rest of the Patreons and everybody else who's been watching this channel and supporting this channel so far. 